In 2011, when Hungary last held this position, the aim was to sound the alarm. The Prime Minister made proposals on economic competitiveness and migration, which I will ask him about now, as he is here in the studio. Prime Minister Viktor Orban, good morning. Good morning. Before we discuss the content of the presidency's program, let's talk about the debate itself. It was interesting that you spoke about Europe, the tasks and challenges facing the Union, while the other speakers, including Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and Mr. Weber, the People's Party president, attacked the Hungarian government and its policies. What do you think caused this duality? Indeed, I found myself in the middle of a very interesting situation. I went there, as is proper for the Hungarian presidency. We have a program. It's a well-thought-out one. I believe it's an excellent piece of professional work. Minister Janos Boka leads a very high-level team. We've put together a top-quality program. Moreover, it's not just us working on such programs. There's also the Draghi report. So other serious countries and individuals are dealing with Europe's problems. We could have had a meaningful debate about why the European economy is struggling, why the U.S. and China are pulling ahead, and what needs to change for us to be competitive again. European money and people's savings end up in America because the European economy can't utilize them properly. There's also the issue with migrants, which we should have discussed. We have a problem with the green transition. European businesses pay two to three times more for electricity than Americans and four to five times more for gas. How can we compete like that? There are issues we should have talked about, and I was prepared for that. But it was obvious that those who gathered were in a bloodthirsty mood, not wanting to have a calm, rational discussion about the biggest challenges Europe faces. Instead, they wanted political brawls, scuffles, however you want to call it. That's what they envisioned. And they came at us. Well, when 10 people come at you, that's rock and roll. It was absolutely rock and roll. But what could be the reason for this? Because, of course, there are political parties for whom we can say that this is their job. But then there's, for example, the president of the commission, who is supposed to be above European politics, above political fault lines. I found myself in a difficult position because Hungarians, after all, are a polite, generous and well-mannered people. So, when invited to such a debate, they want to discuss the topic at hand. So when they come at you, there are two options. Either you ignore it, and I did consider just letting it go and focusing on the work. But so many came at me and so harshly that I feared if we continued being gentlemen, we'd be seen as fools. So I decided we couldn't let this slide. We had to stand up for ourselves and we couldn't owe anyone anything. I thought they were responsible for creating this situation, so we'd respond in kind. Everyone got what they deserved, a few smacks here and there, and I didn't hold back. I brought out all my arguments, knowledge and insights to defend Hungary. Now, I think this shocked everyone. Not only was I surprised, but Hungarian viewers too, who had a very different image of Europe. We thought there were intelligent people there. We thought that European parliamentarians, although there may be a few odd characters who say strange things, still represented some European standard. In the minds of Hungarians, European culture stands for quality. We often criticize our own politicians, and many think that political debates in Europe must surely be more sophisticated. Well, no, the whole thing was below par. It's clear that quite a few of them are under some kind of influence. I too felt like I was in a cultural shock, watching them spew hate, ignoring the facts, and completely disregarding why we were there. No concern for Europe or its people, just hatred and attacks. But this will settle. I've thought it over, and I've tried to understand what happened from a Hungarian perspective. I've concluded that if we aren't blinded by the insults, lies and attacks, it's quite clear what happened.
The European Commission president and the leader of the European People's Party, Ursula von der Leyen and Manfred Weber, announced that they want to overthrow the Hungarian government. They openly stated that they want a different government and even named who should be in this future Brussels-backed government because the current nationalist, sovereignist Hungarian government is not good for them. They openly said it. I suspected this all along. You don't need a Nobel Prize to figure that out. But the audacity of openly declaring it to Hungary, to the world, that instead of focusing on European issues, they want to topple the government of a member state and install another one, was unusually brazen. They even named who would make up the new Hungarian government. The European socialists want to push Clara Dobrev forward, and they applauded her, while the People's Party is backing Peter Marquise. It became clear that this coalition was being formed right in front of us. The ceremony was officiated by von der Leyen like a priest. Manfred Weber was the witness, and the two sides clearly stated they were ready to fulfill Brussels' demands. This means four serious things, all of which they accepted. First, we would enter the war with Ukraine, sending weapons and money from the Hungarian budget. Second, they support Brussels' migration policies, so we would have to let migrants in. Third, they want to repeal our family protection and child protection laws. And finally, we would have to join the economic and trade cold war. This agreement was made right before our eyes. So, Brussels is trying to delegate a socialist and a member of the People's Party into the future Hungarian government, who will then support the most important goals of Brussels, which are the very things causing the conflicts between Hungary and Brussels. In the end, our sovereignist policies would be replaced by a Brussels-controlled government. We would end up looking like those gentlemen and ladies we saw there in the parliament. That's the meaning of what happened. And in light of this, how can we talk about real policy points? Because obviously the Hungarian presidency has proposals regarding the future of the EU, one of which is the migration plan. Yes, but first of all, we need to make it clear that we understand their plan. We saw this lovely little wedding ceremony, this open contract signing, but we're also here and we're not going to just roll over. So maybe they want this in Brussels, but Hungarians don't want this. And maybe they want to send a government here from Brussels, from the Hungarian socialists or from the Tisza party, but Hungarians will have a say in this too. And we're not going to sit idly by. That's why I had to stand up and push back to make it clear that I understand there's a political concept here, but we are going to oppose it. Hungarians will want to decide for themselves what kind of government they have and on what program. It won't work for Brussels to tell us how to live. They're not going to send us their mercenaries to impose this on us. We've been through this before, when they tried to tell us how to live from outside. This won't work. To dictate to us who we should marry, who we should let. Into our country, who we should go to war with, or who we should trade with or not. We've been told this before. We freed ourselves from it 30 years ago. I don't think the Hungarian people want to go back to that. This is the past. What I saw there, this Brussels delegated government for Hungary, smelled just as bad as socialism and the Soviet Union. We've moved past that. We don't want this anymore. This is a free country. And the Hungarian people will decide what happens here. So the first and most important thing is that I announced resistance. We will stand against this Brussels plan to delegate such a government to Hungary. Whatever happens, we will accept the conflict that comes with it. This is what I had to make them understand. They will accept it because they will see that they will lose in this battle. Public opinion, facts and honesty don't favor such Brussels ambitions. Our greatest ally is reality and the public. And I will speak openly if they attack, just like I did now. Russian friendship? I'll bring out the facts and say, you are the ones trading with the Russians in secret. You are the ones buying gas and oil, sure, from Indian and Turkish refineries. And you are paying for it. So let's talk straight. Do you really want this kind of battle? I don't think they do, because they have too much to hide. 
That's why I think they will calm down a bit. They will appreciate this debate and realize it's not a good deal. Let's get back to normal European politics. Let's leave the member states alone, leave Hungary alone. These two jokers they've made a deal with, if they go to Hungary, let's pay them off some other way and forget this whole thing. Let's return to European-style politics. What are the chances of this happening, considering that the attacks against Hungary don't seem to be subsiding, whether we're talking about migration penalties or other issues that appear as points of contention? It looks like policy debates are ongoing between Brussels and Budapest. Well, we do have proposals. First of all, I clearly remember when we had to deal with the consequences of the 2008 financial crisis. That's when we first held the European Union presidency in 2011. And that's when a specific body was created, made up of the prime ministers of the countries belonging to the Eurozone. We said that the financial crisis could only be handled if the problem of the Eurozone, that is the common currency, was dealt with by a separate body of prime ministers. This became the Eurozone Council. And instead of discussing it within the traditional European debate frameworks, we agreed to meet separately to decide how to save the European currency. We are not members of the Eurozone, but we were sometimes invited to these meetings. This body was very effective. At first, it existed informally, then it was institutionalized. So we agreed on it, wrote it down, and recognized that this body exists and has powers. I suggest we do the same with the Schengen Zone. There are countries that are part of the Schengen Zone, which is the area of free movement without borders, and there are those who are not. And those countries that are part of the Schengen Zone, who must also protect Europe's external borders, should meet at the highest level, first informally, and then we institutionalize it and make decisions there. Not in the current European forums, because they are ineffective and do not work. The state of migration clearly shows that the current system is not working. Instead, the prime ministers of the Schengen zone countries should have the authority to decide how border protection should be handled, how we prevent migrants from entering, how we control them, and how we send them back if they have entered illegally. And let's leave the commission and the complicated structures out of it. Let the prime ministers of the countries involved decide. Under this body, we would place Frontex, which is responsible for European border protection. We will direct Frontex so that it no longer functions as a kind of tourism agency, as it does now, bringing migrants into Europe, but finally becomes an organization that deals with the protection of Europe's external borders. This is the essence of our proposal. Yes, but is there any receptivity for this? Or does it make sense to talk about it as long as there's no change in the Union's attitude towards migration? Because as we can see, as you also pointed out, the member states or politicians that stood firm on strict border protection are being punished in some way. However, the world is changing because there is still supposed to be democracy in Europe and people are not happy with what is happening. Governments are falling because of migration. Those who proudly advocated for the welcome culture, the God bless you culture saying migration is a good thing, and decent people support migrants while bad people oppose them. Well, that is changing. People in Europe have lost their sense of security. Streets that were once safe are no longer safe. Women don't go out at night. The crime rate is increasing. They are being threatened with spectacular terrorist attacks. The financial burden of managing migration is enormous. Western Europeans don't look kindly on the fact that while they work, perhaps in lower paying jobs, and work diligently for their wages, migrants who don't work yet receive an amount roughly equal to that. This European system won't be tolerated for long. That's why there's been a shift. That's why I said, welcome to the club, Chancellor Schultz, we're glad. Or the new French interior minister, well, I usually make strong statements on migration, but he went far beyond that. And in the Netherlands, well, there was an election. The anti-migration forces won. Those forces that were previously called the devil incarnate by some received the trust of the Dutch. So all of Europe is turning. Give it a little more time and they will all fall in line with an anti-migration political agenda. 
The second issue, which the Hungarian presidency proposed, is competitiveness, improving competitiveness. More and more people agree that this is a problem, but everyone sees the solutions somewhat differently. We've often seen in the Union that while everyone agrees on the problem, the solutions differ, and that's what hinders action. Right now, the chances of a unified way out of this competitiveness trap are slim, because the positions are far apart. That's why Hungary should focus on itself, not Europe, despite holding the presidency. The truth is, for weeks now, I've been focusing solely on the Hungarian economy. The European Union's Brussels Intifada, their attempt to crucify us, was just a diversion. We must focus on ourselves and the Hungarian economy, and we've put together, regardless of what Europe does, our first major action plan that will give new momentum to the Hungarian economy. Yesterday I spent the whole day working with the head of the economic cabinet, all afternoon, and the concrete measures are now taking shape. We will give enormous momentum to the Hungarian economy. Regardless of what Europe says, we maintain economic neutrality, meaning we only accept what's good for Hungarians from both the West and the East, and we reject what's against our interests. So the strategic foundation of what we're doing is in place. This economic neutrality will result in a 3 to 6 percent economic growth. We won't see this in the current quarter, nor in the fourth quarter, where growth will be around 1 to 2 percent, but in the first quarter of 2025, we'll see a huge boost. We've identified three major intervention points. The first is affordable housing. This is what we need to focus on now. Let's leave European matters behind. We've settled those. Now we need to deal with our own lives. Affordable housing. We're waiting for Budapest to finally say something because the biggest problem is in Budapest, but it seems they are preoccupied with something else. Still, we are ready for negotiations. From dormitory construction to providing young people with affordable housing, even supporting their rent, we have ready concepts. These are in good shape. We will continue to support the Hungarian village program, rural housing and house construction and people's savings, which have accumulated and cannot currently be used to create affordable housing. We will eliminate bureaucratic obstacles so that people can use their savings, for example, to renovate homes. There will be a housing boom. The second point is that negotiations with trade unions are progressing well. It looks like we will be able to agree on the minimum wage and wage increases. Ultimately, it's up to them. I don't consider it unrealistic, I'll repeat, that our goal is for the average salary in Hungary to be one million forints. Alongside this, we will introduce the worker loan. There's already a student loan for young learners, and now we will give young workers starting out in life a similar loan. This is also nearly finalized. The third major intervention point in our action plan concerns small businesses, which have been battered by inflation, the war, sanctions, and COVID. We want to help them grow in size, to help them take the next step towards stability and growth. Internally, we call this the Demjan Sander program, although it's not official yet, we haven't received approval, where we will provide capital, favorable loans and various tools to help small and medium-sized enterprises scale up and become more stable. So we will intervene in these three areas. The Demjan Sandor program for small businesses, income support through worker loans and higher minimum wages, and affordable housing initiatives and measures. Together, these will give the Hungarian economy a boost. This will become very clear in the first or second quarter of 2025. That's what I'm focusing on. And as for the Brussels crowd, they can eat what they've cooked. What is needed to create the necessary fiscal space for the implementation of these programs, meaning to ensure that there is money for them? Growth is required. There are major developments for which various development loans can be obtained from the European Development Bank, from China, or from European or Asian financial markets. That's a solvable issue. Good investments can find funding as long as we wisely select the goals and properly manage our financial capacity. 
In reality, for the things I'm talking about here, the funding must be generated from the internal growth of the Hungarian economy, while at the same time reducing public debt and the budget deficit. This is possible. We've calculated and planned it out, and it's progressing well. The government will soon be discussing these matters. Yesterday, the Minister of Economy presented the figures, trends, and the entire concept to me. Soon, a general government decree will be issued, outlining the tasks, and a week or two after that, I believe the specific measures will also be announced. Naturally, we need to consult, meaning with interest groups, the stakeholders in the economy, and ultimately, we'll need to discuss these measures with the people as well. We want to create a kind of new agreement to boost the Hungarian economy, because if a new economic policy is needed due to the changing world, we also need a new agreement to go along with it. The question is, when these measures can resonate with people, meaning when they will feel the impact, because if we look at the economic data, we see that inflation decreased to 3% in September. However, consumption is a bit slower to kick in, despite real wages having been increasing for almost a year now. But there is a turnaround in September. By the way, I don't consider discussions about consumption to be healthy debates, because ultimately, what is it about? You receive your income. The government or anyone else shouldn't try to dictate to you, some economists saying what you should do, consume it. Well, you will consume it if you want to, but you might say, I don't want to consume, I want to save because my child needs an apartment, or I want to upgrade my current one, or who knows what the future holds. It's better to keep it. Ultimately, you will decide. I have never appreciated those economic policy debates where I feel as a citizen that someone is trying to tell me what to do with my money. People know best how to handle their income. We should allow them to decide and instead offer them options, and then they will choose. Nevertheless, I think consumption looks quite encouraging in September. It is evident that there is money available since there has been nearly a 10% increase in real wages. So. If I factor inflation out of the wage increase, we are left with a 9 to 10 percent increase, which I believe is unprecedented in Europe. The real problem isn't this. The issue arises from the slowdown in the production of the European automotive industry. One of the defining sectors of the Hungarian economy is the automotive industry. Thirty years ago, we wouldn't have thought of ourselves this way, but we are now a major automotive power. I believe there are only three countries in the world where all the major German car brands are present. Germany itself, China, and Hungary. Moreover, as the automotive industry is transitioning to electromobility, moving away from traditional drivetrains and fuels to electric vehicles, we have done a lot to ensure that traditional factories aren't closed down and that we don't end up with 300, 400,000 people out of work. For this reason, we have taken the lead in this transformation. I can now confidently say that all the major car manufacturers will remain in Hungary because the investments that have started, based on the agreement with the Hungarian government, will keep production in Hungary for the future of automotive manufacturing. I think this is a tremendous achievement which people may not yet see, but in two or three years it will be obvious that we were several steps ahead of the world when we transitioned Hungarian car manufacturing to electromobility. This includes battery production and many other aspects, and of course we need to consider people's opinions, the environment, and we must protect it, as we only have one country. But I believe that by adopting German standards, this is feasible, and Hungarian automotive manufacturing will receive a new momentum. I project this to happen in the second half of next year, when the global market develops such that there is a demand for these cars, not just for Hungarian people, as they will use only a small portion of the cars produced here, but we will sell them to the world. When automotive manufacturing and purchases increase again, in the second half of the year, just as new factories are opening in Hungary, automotive manufacturing will also gain momentum. Therefore, I dare to assert that the Hungarian government will raise economic growth to a range of 3 to 6 percent next year. We talked about next year, and yesterday at the Ethnographic Museum, I also mentioned that 2025 and 2026 will be years for stabilizing families and small businesses, but then we can start moving toward bigger things again. It's time for planners to sharpen their pencils again. If we look at the long term, what are the prospects for the Hungarian economy? Right.
I also asked Prime Minister Viktor Orban about the recent European Parliament debate, the proposals from Hungary's EU presidency, and the new economic policy.